Okay, hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. Hey. That was hot. <laughs> oh, wow, we're all here. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little problem with my invite. Oh, it's all good. Oh. I'll stop my share. Okay, I'll start mine. How are you guys? Hey, good. good. I can you guys can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is my volume okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just uh, having some trouble with these earphones. But uh, good. Are you feeling uh, better, Sarah? After having had a cold and oh you my goodness, I, you know, I actually I tested negative for COVID, but I I don't believe I didn't have COVID, and it was uh, okay. Oh man. Yeah, I think it's it's gonna be a few weeks. Something's gone sideways here. Let me try this. Again. Mm, there you go. Um, can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just there. We go. Perfect. There you go. There we go. <clears throat> Fits in nicely, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And for everybody that's that's joining, mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, the um, Sarah's website, wellsunday.com, is there and. I've also just popped the link in in the chat box. We are recording. That's good. So yeah. And we're at six. So that's perfect. Perfect. Great. Well, I yeah, I'm glad that you're feeling that you're feeling better because i know there's a few things going around that they're taking a while to get oh my goodness yeah <laughs> so, um yeah so glad that you could be here Thank um you. so welcome everybody where this is session number two of uh, gut health and chronic pain that we're moving through this month with dr sarah robbins really happy to have her here and um, I'm, I'll pass it to Dr. Mark to open us up and get us going here. Okay. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, Sarah. And, uh, you know, we have the privilege of having you for this uh, four-week program on, on the microbiome and gut health. So thank you very much. You know, it's, uh, it's been really, really well attended and well received. You know, the first, uh, the first evening was uh, probably one of the busiest we've ever had, I think. So that's phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah, you know, on behalf of the clinic, thank you very much for for putting on this series. It's really important, and you know, we hope to learn a lot. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks well, nice nice to see you guys, and nice to uh, to have all the participants out there. Um, I can't see you with the way we have this webinar set up, so I'm happy for um, questions as as we go. Um, and Madeline's going to keep an eye on, on the chat, um, and any questions that come up. So yeah, we'll just, uh, keep it easy going. I embedded some, uh, QR codes into this presentation. So, um, a little bit further along, there's sort of some more practical things, um, that we can do around gut health. And there's some PDFs and links that are um, that, you, that you can access. So if you just have your phone handy, you will be able to scan the QR code from your computer screen and you can um, download and access all of those, those um, Wow, that's PDFs fantastic. I haven't figured out how to do that. <laughs> oh, there's so much good stuff out there these days. So tonight we're gonna talk about uh, the microbiome a little bit and linking um, microbiome to uh, pain. Now, <laughs> I do this with the caveat that I am the gut expert and not the pain expert. Um, but and I think many of your audience will be um, very well informed. So we'll uh, we'll kind of um, not spend too too much time on on that, and um, hopefully spend most of our time this evening um, speaking around really practical applications for how to get a healthy gut microbiome and um, and a healthy gut. This is really an emerging field. I think that's my second caveat. There, there is so much coming out on this. It's so fascinating. Um, but we also have a lot to learn, both in terms of understanding the pathophysiology, 
the links between the gut and the brain uh, and the gut microbiome, and then how we use that for therapeutic purposes uh, and how we use that um, even to go a step further and not only have a healthy gut, but how we um, can potentially even manage um, chronic pain through uh, gut health and a healthy gut microbiome. So a lot to come uh, over the over the next few years in this topic, and uh, we'll have to revisit it once a year, maybe. So let's start with defining what the microbiome is. And uh, many of us have heard about it, we talk about it, but it's really this complex community. And if you joined us last week, we talk about it uh, in terms of being more of an ecosystem, thinking about the microbiome like this old growth forest that's that's a part of um, a, a part of us, and it's really composed of a number of different organisms that include bacteria, viruses, fun fungi, and other types of microbes. So it's not just bacteria, and I think that that's uh, an important uh, thing to know about because that uh, helps us understand. Um, sometimes what supplements might be useful uh, that we can use and leverage to obtain uh, good gut health. The microbiome is important for a number of different reasons, and this is just a small um, list. We know that, that there are many, many uh, relevant applications for understanding the gut microbiome. Uh, it's important, uh, in, you know, in this context, in terms of digestive health, uh, not only in terms of uh, breaking down fiber and complex carbohydrates, um, but a number of other uh, mechanisms. It helps us to train and regulate the immune system, much of which is housed inside the gut, and it helps to protect us against uh, harmful microbes. It also has an interaction with the uh, gut-brain axis through a number of different mechanisms, so it has a potential to modulate uh, mental health as well as uh, the health of our gut and potentially um, even help us to understand how to manage pain. So it's an important part of our overall well-being. We can think of it in terms of metabolic health as well and cardiovascular health. Uh, and I'm sure a number of, of uh, new mechanisms uh, are, are going to continue to be um, elucidated. So understanding the gut-brain uh, connection becomes really important because the microbiome, these trillions of organisms um, that reside uh, within us, uh, has been shown to, um, to modulate parts of the nervous system, and this can um, potentially help to understand how this impacts pain. So the gut-brain axis really refers to the biochemical signaling that takes place between the gastrointestinal tract and the central nervous system. And this involves direct and indirect um, pathways that not only allow the gut to relay information to the brain, but also enable the brain to exert an influence back on the gut. This includes uh, neuroanatomical connections such as the vagus nerve, uh, the enteric nervous system, or that second brain, um, which is the nervous system of uh, the gut uh, that operates semi-independently, but also communicates with the central nervous system via the vagus nerve and the spinal cord, and is really um, very important in a number of digestive processes. Um, there are a number of biochemical uh, signaling pathways, including neurotransmitters, uh, the immune system, and hormonal signaling, um, all of which are an important part of the gut-brain axis, really allowing the gut and the brain to uh, interact and communicate. And this has a number of um, clinical applications uh, that relate to mental health, to our stress response, uh, and to brain health. So we can link the uh, microbiome and the nervous system through a number of, of different ways. Um, and there have been um, demonstrated impacts uh, on behavior uh, and uh, mental and emotional health, um, neurotransmitter production. And um, now we're also seeing uh, some links with neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So really interesting uh, links between the microbiome and the brain are starting to emerge. When it comes to chronic pain, um, the microbiome is really central to uh, that gut-brain axis. So the communication between the gut and the brain is really mediated 
by um, the gut microbiome, almost acting as a translator in uh, the conversation between your brain and your gut. And this can influence uh, a number of different um, pathways, including pain perception and uh, chronic pain conditions. The microbiome is also involved uh, in uh, an inflammatory response and uh, can help to regulate uh, inflammation, uh, not only in the gut, but through uh, chemicals and neurotransmitters that then uh, are related to systemic inflammation. And this may in turn be related to the perpetuation of chronic pain. And finally, neurotransmitters um, are uh, produced and metabolized by the gut microbiome, uh, which can help to modulate pain sensitivity as well as the body's uh, pain response. So all of these uh, different factors uh, can really play into um, how the microbiome uh, impacts pain. And of course, we also know that this helps to regulate our stress response and our, our stress response is really um, very important in terms of how we're able to manage and cope with pain. Um, and there's also some emerging uh, evidence that shows us that gut bacteria may influence the um, endogenous or our own production of, um, of opiates that um, can relate to the pain response. So we know that the gut microbiome is really important um, in this pathway. And I think a lot of the, the pathophysiology and our understanding of that um, is really continuing to evolve. But one of the things that, that you know, we often talk about is how you can get a healthy mi gut microbiome. What do, if we know it's so important, what do we need to do uh, in order to maintain um, the health of the microbiome and really optimize uh, gut health uh, so that we can have all of these other um, benefits across um, our entire body? So that leads me to the question of, well, what is a healthy gut microbiome? What does that actually mean? And it encompasses a number of, of different um, characteristics. So we know that a healthy gut microbiome um, is diverse. It has uh, a rich array of different microbial species, bacteria um, that provide kind of a robust response against pathogens, um, contribute to better health outcomes, and overall help to, um, to improve uh, our, our own resilience. So higher microbial diversity is associated with improved metabolic processes and immune responses. And in general, the more diversity we have in the microbiome, the better. There's also a, a term called eubiosis um, of bacterial populations, meaning that beneficial microbes outnumber and outcompete potentially harmful ones. So an imbalance is dysbiosis, where um, there are more uh, harmful than beneficial bacteria, and that can lead to or exacerbate conditions um, like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, obesity, metabolic diseases, um, and even mental health disorders. We know that certain bacteria are known to be um, particularly beneficial for health and, and um, we're learning more about these all the time, but you may hear um, about um, bacteria such as bifidobacterium or lactobacilli um, that have important uh, roles in helping us digest food, um, produce vitamins and support the immune system. They're also known to produce short chain fatty acids, which are really critical for uh, gut health. A healthy microbiome produces beneficial metabolites. So the short chain fatty acids that we talked about, um, other types of chemicals that are produced by the microbiome help to regulate gut cells, immune cells, and they also maintain the integrity of the um, gut lining. A healthy uh, microbiome is able to respond and adapt to changes in your diet. And it has a lot of resilience and stability over time. Our gut microbiome has a number of different functions. And so it's really important, it plays an, an important role in a number of different factors. It's important for digestion and production of um, nutrients. So it's really a key player um, in digestion and absorption. You know, I think we always used to think of 
our gut as being the, the main player in digestion and absorption. But in fact, the gut microbiome breaks down a lot of nutrients um, that are not digested in the small bowel and, and are intact when they reach the colon. So the gut microbiome is really important for that. It helps to produce vitamins as well as to release vitamins from nutrients. Um, it's involved, as I mentioned before, in the regulation of the immune system. It helps to protect against other types of pathogens. The gut microbiome is involved in the motility of the gut, which really influences a lot of, of our gut function. Um, and it's also been shown to be important um, in the gut-brain axis, as we've mentioned. So it has a number of different roles, and that's probably quite a short list. I, I could uh, make it even longer. So when we think about the factors that deteriorate the gut microbiome, there's a number of different ones. And I think that the obvious one is antibiotic use um, because antibiotics are harmful to, um, to negative bacteria, but they're also harmful to beneficial bacteria that are in our gut. We know that there's a number of associations with diet uh, and an unhealthy diet that deteriorate the gut microbiome. And we're gonna talk about a little, a few of those today. Chronic sleep, um, deprivation, stress uh, have both been associated with, with negative um, impacts on the uh, gut microbiome. Um, there are a number of environmental toxins um, that have also uh, been shown to deteriorate the gut microbiome. And unfortunately, as we get older, um, aging um, is associated with less diversity and less resilience uh, in the gut microbiome. There's a number of other types of GI infections um, that can also be quite disruptive um, to the gut microbiome in general. Sorry, I have, a, I have an interesting question that might be helpful right now, uh, but uh, Cease, just if I can just ask this now, Cease asks, I think I can imagine a microbiome, but what is it specifically? Like, is it in the juices and the enzymes in the stomach? Is it a form or, or is it a fluid? Oh, that's a, it's a great question. So, um, <laughs> so when we're talking about the gut microbiome, we're mostly talking about the bacteria that reside in the colon. Um, there's, there's, uh, a, a real, you know, ecosystem is a, is a great way to think of the gut because microbiome because it's really um, organized differently throughout the gut. So um, the microbiome that's in our mouth compared to the few organisms that live in our stomach uh, compared to the small bowel compared to the colon are all very different. So when we're referring to the gut microbiome, we're really talking about the, the massive number of bacteria that reside in the colon in the large bowel. And those are sort of um, mixed throughout, they're, they're mixed into the stool, so they're just present in the lumen or the inside of the gut, but they're also um, adherent along the cell walls of the gut. So they, they form, um, you know, people have probably heard about um, biofilm, so there's uh, a film of bacteria, um, which isn't a bad thing that, that resides along the lining of the gut, and then they, they're also, you know, within the stool and the fluids that are inside the, the lining of the gut. And so there's a real, there's, there's a lot of order actually to the gut microbiome in terms of how it's organized. Um, not only in terms of, of the abundance and diversity of different types of organisms, um, but also along the length of the GI tract, it really varies quite a bit. We're gonna talk about fiber, but um, when we get to insoluble fiber, um, a lot of, of insoluble fibers, if you think about the roughage that we eat, um, almost provides like um, scaffolding within the stool or structure that that really allows like a lot of um, microbes to exist and and to thrive with within the gut. So it's one of the roles of of um, the fiber that we eat is to provide that kind of scaffolding or structure for them to hang on to. <laughs> wow! And on the last list, um, infections like parasites or other other bacteria. Uh, and, and even viral infections, you know, which is interesting, if we think about a viral gastroenteritis, um, that can have a deleterious impact on, um, on the, the micro, microbiome or the type of bacteria. So it almost when we get an infection of any type um, within the gut, it kind of disrupts the balance. You can almost think of it as being like this 
um, teeter totter, seesaw um, of of um, good versus bad, and um, that that balance that we're often in can be disrupted by a number of different types of infections, whether um, they're they're viral or or bacterial, um, and and so it's that imbalance that that occurs. Thanks. So we want to keep our microbiome healthy, and there's a number of different levers that we can pull um, to do that, and that's what we want to talk about tonight, really um, practical steps for how we can maintain the health of our microbiome, whether we come into that um, in a state of health or with a really healthy um, microbiome that's well-balanced, or whether uh, we are um, in a state of imbalance, perhaps after having had an infection or antibiotics or some kind of um, exposure. How do we how do we tip the scales? How do we get back into balance? Um, and these recommendations are are relevant uh, in both instances. So we can use nutrition as our primary lever um, to achieve a healthier microbiome. It's really the number one thing that you can do. And if we think about wanting to have a lot of diversity and abundance in the microbiome. Um, the more diversity and abundance we have, um, the better the health outcomes across a number of different disease states. Then um, the more diverse and abundance our nutrition and our diet, um, the more we're gonna drive diversity and abundance in the microbiome. So they really, really go hand in hand. Um, we know that um, processed and um, sugary foods a lot of things that we're exposed to have uh, negative impacts on the health of the gut microbiome. So really thinking about whole foods um, and foods that we're able to, um, to cook from home or avoiding packaging, things like that, um, actually become quite relevant to the health of the gut microbiome. Uh, and choosing healthy um, fats, so avoiding, um, you know, trans fats aren't, aren't uh, widely available anymore to us, thankfully. Um, but, um, you know, saturated fats, for example, are, are associated with um, a less uh, robust microbiome. So in general, we want to think about eliminating these types of inflammatory foods. So highly processed foods, um, processed meats, for example, that have a number of additives, uh, nitrates and um, binders and things like that, refined carbohydrates. Uh, and unhealthy fats have all been shown to increase um, gut inflammation and, and to have a negative impact on the gut microbiome. We want to focus on our fruits and veggies and fibers as much as possible. Um, these are important um, for the function of the gut overall, but they're also extremely important for promoting a uh, healthy gut microbiome. And then we want to think about what we can do to incorporate probiotic rich foods uh, into our diet um, to add a further layer of support. So as I mentioned, diversity matters. Uh, and the more whole grains, um, whole foods, uh, fruits and veggies that you can pack in uh, to your diet in general, um, the better. This has been shown to have a number of, um, of positive impacts overall. Um, and around promoting a, a healthy uh, gut microbiome. So fiber is particularly important and not all fiber is the same. Um, there's two different types of fiber that we can think of primarily. Soluble fiber is the type of fiber that dissolves in water and forms kind of a, a gel-like substance. So soluble fiber um, can be fermented by the bacteria in the gut um, which leads to the production of these short chain fatty acids, which have a number of health benefits. So, so when um, the gut microbiome breaks down these soluble type fibers, the chemicals that are released from that um, pro provide short chain fatty acids. And these are fuel cells or for the cells of the lining of the gut. They have been shown to reduce inflammation. They regulate the immune system on a number of different levels. The things we can think about are um, oats, for example, um, apples, or in a supplement, psyllium uh, husk, which has been around for a long, long time, uh, is a great source of soluble. 
insoluble fiber, like I mentioned, uh, is that, that roughage. And um, this is really important for adding bulk to the stool. So if we think about things like whole grains, nuts or seeds, um, the, the firmer skins on a lot of fruits or vegetables, um, this really forms uh, more of an insoluble type fiber, which helps to regulate bowel movement. So getting more fiber into our diet can be hard. And so many people say this to me, they're like, I know I should eat fiber. I've been told to have fiber so many times, but I don't feel um, well when I do it. And I think the number one um, thing I can tell you to do is to go slow. <laughs> it's so important because as you're adding more dietary fiber and really trying to, to steer towards more fruits and vegetables and high grains, you need to do that kind of um, slowly and then allow your gut microbiome and your gut time to adapt and get used to that. And then you can add a little bit more and then you get a little bit more adaptation. So that, so that process really kind of goes hand in hand where as you add a little bit of time, you'll get more adaptation, which um, will help to improve your tolerance over the long term. And think often we think, gosh, you know, I'm going to go home. I'm going to do a really good job of eating well this week. And so we load up on fruits and vegetables and fibers. And, and it feels um, not great because you like get a lot of gas and bloating and changes in your gut. Um, and uh, and that, that kind of throws you off and then we go back to square one. So going really, really slowly with a gradual intake um, is really important. And if you tend towards constipation, making sure you have a lot of fluid and a lot of water, it's really um, very important to that. Um, fiber is a carbohydrate, and so it's always going to be listed um, when we look at nutrition labels um, under the carbohydrate section. There's not very many um, companies or labels that actually state whether it's soluble or insoluble. Um, so sometimes you have to do a little bit of, of searching if, if you're looking um, for lists around like what's a soluble fiber versus what's an insoluble fiber. You kind of have to uh, to poke around a little bit at, at, around that. If you're looking at supplements, psyllium, um, flaxseed and oat bran are all like very commonly available uh, fiber supplements um, that are that are easy to find. And though, those of you who really struggle with a lot of gas and bloating may be sensitive to FODMAPs, which is a whole other um, topic uh, around uh, gut health and, and irritable bowel syndrome in particular. But this is really a big source of, of bloating um, for a lot of people. So if you struggle to incorporate fiber because of gas and bloating and abdominal pain, um, then looking for fiber that is low in FODMAPs can be really helpful. FODMAPs are fermentable carbohydrates, essentially, that when um, they're inside the gut, they are not digested. And so they get to the colon largely intact, where the gut microbiome break them down, which is a good thing in terms of, main, of releasing short chain fatty acids, but it causes a whole lot of gas and air. So it's really uncomfortable. And then those small little carbohydrates also tend to have an osmotic effect where they pull water into the bowel, which creates a lot of um, fluid shifts into the bowel and diarrhea for many people. So, so FODMAPs often cause a lot of discomfort and you can get fiber that is low in um, FODMAPs. It's a lot easier to tolerate. Um, if you scan uh, that little uh, QR code, that'll give you some tips and pointers so you can you can um, scan that. And again, really starting low and very slowly and gradually increasing uh, is the, the key to success. There's a number of different fiber supplements out there. So if you feel like making diet changes to get more fruits and vegetables and whole grains um, is unrealistic for any number of reasons, then you know there's a lot of really great fiber supplements that are out on the market now that, that there didn't used to be. Um, there's a couple in particular that are, uh, they have a little asterisk beside them and those are low FODMAPs fiber supplements. They're actually very easy to find in most um, drug stores and health food stores. So psyllium has been around forever. <laughs> Many of you um, know that by its trade name, um, but you can also see partially hydrolyzed guar gum, 
um, which I find a lot of people who don't tolerate fiber um, in their diet particularly well actually do do quite well with partially hydrolyzed bar bar gum. Um, and you can get that in a number of, of um, supplements at, at various, various health food stores. So that's a great source. Um, I love ground flax seeds uh, and chia seeds for adding to day-to-day -day, um, smoothies and cereals and cooking and things like that. So those are, are easy ones to get in as well. Sarah, Sarah what about um, Metamucil? That's a, an old familiar friend for most, to most people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Metamucil is psyllium husk, actually. That, that's what it is. It's psyllium. Um, you know, my advice around that, though, is to get the cheapest, <laughs> blandest stuff that you can find. Because often um, supplements, um, you know, for marketing purposes and to make them more palatable, make them actually taste good, they have a lot of um, flavorings and additives. But if you are sensitive to gas and bloating and pain or FODMAPs, then often the flavoring um, or the uh, non-nutritive or artificial sweeteners um, that are put in those um, to make them taste better actually causes you symptoms. So if you've okay. tried to take um, a fiber supplement uh, and haven't done very well with it, then then my recommendation is is twofold. Number one, make sure that you're not getting additives in it by having the most boring stuff that you can find. Um, and the second is to reduce the dose probably down to, to about an eighth. So you want to like go way, way, way down on the dose. Um, so if the label says take one or two tablespoons, you start with like half a teaspoon and do that for a couple of weeks and then slowly and gradually increase the amount you're getting. And, and that'll really help from a tolerance standpoint. Thanks. Um, just, could you go back and just show the QR code again? For Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you bet. And if, if you guys uh, know how to, how to do that, my kids showed me this, uh, you just take your phone and go on photo and, um, but I can also uh, probably give out some of the information in the follow-up email. Uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll send all the everything over to you. Yeah. Great. Um, there's a couple of questions about um, vegetables since we're right here, if that's okay now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, while people are, are getting the, the QR code. Um, she says, I've just been told that there's some type of acid in kale and spinach that are not good for humans and we should boil both before eating. How impactful is this asset to asset acid to our overall diet? Yeah, you know, I I had a really interesting conversation with a friend um, yesterday about sulfur containing um, foods, and um, I think it really highlights a lot of of the messaging around um, food that we get nowadays. Um, we have so much refinement in terms of understanding the biochemistry of food that. It, it comes out into, into various social media and different types of blogs and things like that. And then we make it really, really, really complicated. And so, yeah. um, you know, for the, the vast majority of the time, it, if we um, take an isolated compound out of a food and we study it in the lab, that's really very different than what its biological effect is for us day to day in an amount that we would normally consume. So, you know, if you had a wheelbarrow full of spinach or a regular plate full of spinach, the effects are gonna be different. And so my answer around most of those things for the vast majority of people is not to worry about them. I think oh. we make food overly complicated. You know, we've been, <laughs> we've been on a kale craze for like 10 years now, right? It's been the, the vegetable to have. And, um, and we don't really see people doing unwell because of the amount of kale they're getting. So, you know, I think, right. I think be just really, really practical when we're getting those kind of messaging um, in general. I, I don't think when they're part of a healthy balanced diet where you're getting a lot of variety and a lot of different types of plant sources and nutrients from a lot of different things um, that, that those really specific concerns actually add up to anything um, clinically meaningful. Right. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't that. worry about it. <laughs> we we can really, myself included, get so caught up on what I, because I also have a spinach smoothie every day. So yeah. And um, we can really get caught up in the should and, and the shouldn'ts, right? Uh, um, so that's, yeah, that's great yeah. to hear. Just another one along the line of veggies while we're here. 
Um, are, is there any value, uh, Peter asked, any value in the proprietary probiotics, the engineered bacterial strains offered today versus good diet, or would both be effective in treating chronic pain? Um, and are some fibers linked to better results than others? For example, lentils versus leeks. So, um, so there's a couple of different parts to that question. And, and um, we'll, we'll circle back to when we talk a little bit about prebiotics, um, uh, which are important um, form of, of fiber, um, actually like they, they form resistant fiber or resistant starches, I mean, that are broken down. Um, so yeah, the different types of fiber do have different impacts on the gut and they have different impacts on the gut microbiome. And my answer is a little bit similar. They're all important. There isn't one that's better than another. Um, they do different things. They have different functions. And so it really depends a little bit on, um, on what you're looking for. So for example, if you tend to have a lot of uh, gas and bloating, then you may look, be looking more towards trying to get more soluble type of fibers. They generally tend to be a little bit better tolerated. If you have a lot of constipation, you may be looking towards getting more insoluble fibers. It gets more complicated if we're trying to eat particular food to drive a particular bacterial species in the gut. So, you know, you're thinking I'm going to eat more of food A in order to get more of bacteria Y. <laughs> That's the thinking that that we're really kind of starting to get very interested in. And I think um, that has potential from uh, um, a really personalized nutrition standpoint and strategy. Um, but I also think right now that it's not ready for prime time and we don't have really enough specifics and information to start, um, making, making some of those, um, uh, recommendations or guidelines on a broad basis. So I would say, you know, get a variety of fibers, um, because again, we really want to, we know without question that driving diversity and abundance is important. And the more variety you get in your diet, including variety of fibers, the more you're going to be able to give different nutrients to different type of bacteria, which overall increases abundance. Maybe I'll slip one more in right now, yeah. uh, just because it, it, I don't, I never know if it's a long answer or a short answer, but these things <laughs> I have no idea. Are lemons healthy for the gut, gut biome? Are lemons healthy? Yeah, like lemon juice. I hear a lot about, you know, having lemon juice and water in the morning for your gut. Yeah, yeah. I um <laughs> I don't I don't think there's like one specific food that's like the thing that's gonna help us with our gut. You know, I I um I hear it all the time, like if it's if it's oatmeal or lemons or um spinach, <laughs> you know, we hear about like it's there's an, isn't one thing that's great. Um, it's, it's really getting that abundance and diversity in all different kinds of things. Um, the lemon water thing is, has not really had a lot of scientific data, um, for it. Uh, I think a lot of people get benefit from having a nice hot cup of lemon water in the morning. And I don't think it's necessarily related to the lemon. I think it's often related to, um, number one, taking time to relax, <laughs> which is good for your gut health and probably a lot of other things. Um, and I think getting more fluid uh, and sometimes that warm water first thing in the morning kind of stimulates things to get, get moving in the morning, um, which can be helpful if you tend towards constipation. But there isn't actually a lot of really um, strong scientific data that, that tells us that lemon juice is the thing. <laughs> Thank you. So we want to think about fermented foods as well as being a source of probiotics. And, um, you know, when we look at definitions of um, fermented foods uh, that provide probiotics specifically, um, yogurt and kefir are the only two things on the market that have been very well studied in terms of their specific bacterial content and their specific impacts on different aspects of health. So um, irritable bowel linking um, probiotics in yogurt, for example. 
we don't have a lot of data around the, um, the type of bacteria that are in other foods that we know do contain um, bacteria. So we know that kombucha, kefir, sauerkraut, a number of other types of food do in fact contain live microorganisms, but they haven't been extensively studied in terms of their um, probiotic capacity. So we don't know what sauerkraut does specifically to irritable bowel, for example. What we do know again is that the more fermented um, foods we get um, in our diet, the more we're generally introducing more types of bacteria. Um, and that seems to be important overall for promoting a healthy gut microbiome. So lots of different food sources um, that contain living bacteria um, are, are helping to contribute to that abundance and diversity. And then polyphenols are naturally occurring plant compounds that have antioxidant um, properties. And, you know, if you think about things that you'd want to take to have beautiful skin or hair that are, that are good for you, for you in terms of antioxidants and, and lots of nutrients and, and plant chemicals, um, those same things are also good for your microbiome. So if it's good for you, <laughs> it's good for your gut bacteria. And it's probably a generally um, a, a good way to think about the nutrients that we ingest. So, you know, getting back to, to one of the questions, prebiotics, um, this is the difference between different types of, of fibers. Um, prebiotic foods are really crucial in enhancing the gut microbiome um, because they are non-digestible fibers. Um, and they're things like oligosaccharides or inulin, if anyone's ever seen um, supplements with inulin in them, that resist digestion in the upper GI tract. And so they get to the colon largely intact, where they can be fermented by beneficial bacteria. Um, so prebiotics help to uh, stimulate um, healthy bacteria. They can be turned into short-chain fatty acids and other uh, important metabolites, that which... Um, help to uh, modulate the immune system and, and all other um, kinds of good things. So, you know, we can think of prebiotics uh, in terms of, of being um, garlic or onions or asparagus, um, bananas, those are all um, good sources of prebiotics. We can also think of things like resistant starches. Um, so if we think about cooked potatoes, for example, they have a lot of resistant starch that acts as a prebiotic. Um, whole grains, uh, lots of different types of fruit, you know, pectin. So you think about um, applesauce, how it, it um, gets that sort of gooey consistency or gel-like consistency um, also has prebiotic fibers. So those are great source of, of um, nutrients, again, to really foster the health of the gut microbiome. So we need prebiotics in order to really encourage um, the health of the mi gut microbiome. But if you think about it, they're also really important to, to the utilization of probiotics. So when we ingest probiotics for, um, for beneficial purposes, our diet helps to sustain uh, those probiotics. So it doesn't, it doesn't make much sense to have um, a, a bag of chips with a probiotic when you're trying to maintain a healthy gut microbiome, right? We want to give, when we're, when we're taking probiotics, when we're um, trying to get um, fermented foods into our diet and really encourage that abundance and diversity, the nutrition that, again, that we would have for ourselves um, is also really important for the health of those bacteria that we're taking. So they really need to go hand in hand. Um, so when we're taking probiotics, which I'm gonna talk about next, we want to think about incorporating prebiotic sources into them because those prebiotics, pre meaning they come before, are really the nutrients that help to sustain um, probiotics when we when we do um, take them. So probiotics are another way to um, to increase diversity and abundance in the gut microbiome, and it's important to note that they need to be alive to be considered a probiotic. So. We want them to be living so that they can really get into the gut and set up shop essentially um, and stay inside um, the gut and uh, really be able to proliferate. 
Now, we know that the gut microbiome is more than just bacteria, and similarly, probiotics can be more than um, just bacteria. Uh, so for example, many of you would have seen a yeast probiotic called Saccharomyces, um, which is really commonly available for a number of different um, reasons. One of the things to remember is that species and strain matters. And, and so what's commercially available and what's been studied in, in um, larger clinical trials may not always be the same. And so sometimes um, what, what works in a clinical trial just may not be commercially available to us as consumers. Um, and that, that can make a difference when we're looking at the data. So the benefits of a lot of probiotics are actually very strain specific. Probiotics have a number of um, potential benefits when it comes to uh, gut health in terms of balancing the gut microbiome and aiding in nutrient absorption. There are some studies that suggest that they can help improve uh, immune function, uh, reduce inflammation. They're really important in preventing and treating um, diarrhea and in particular antibiotic associated diarrhea. And then there's some emerging data that they may be uh, important uh, to mental health uh, through a reduction in um, inflammatory uh, mediators um, through the gut-brain axis. So a lot of emerging and, and potential benefits to um, probiotics. So, um, and that last QR code, um, uh, is uh, just a little guide to um, how to choose probiotics. How do you choose the right one? Because there's so many out there. Uh, and so to speak to that, you know, the most important thing um, that you can do is number one, identify what you're taking the probiotic for. Because when we look at the data, different types of probiotics do different jobs. So it depends if you're, if you're trying to treat um, you know, a skin or a mental health condition, or you're trying to treat irritable bowel syndrome, um, or even within gut health, if you're treating antibiotic associated diarrhea, or um, ulcerative colitis, those are completely different data sets and different types of um, bacteria that may be beneficial um, for that particular condition. So just like when you're choosing a medication, you need to think about the specific um, outcome or health need that you have that you want to choose an antibiotic or a probiotic for. It's important to understand um, different types of strains, um, their the colony forming units or how much is in a probiotic, the concentration of it, because in order to be effective, you have to have enough of it. And then again, you want it to be um, a living uh, organism. So quality control does matter. Um, we want to add prebiotics. Again, you want to add the nutrition um, through fiber and prebiotics that are really going to sustain those bacteria once you've consumed them. And it's often uh, really helpful to talk to uh, a pharmacist or a health professional when you're trying to wade through um, the, the massive number of um, probiotics that are on the market right now, because there really are a lot of them. So um, this, is, this is actually a, a great PDF document from the Alliance for Education on Probiotics. It's their 2024 guide to choosing probiotics. It's, um, it's extensive <laughs> and it breaks down probiotic choice based on um, what health outcome you're looking for. So if you're looking for a really good resource on, um, on choosing a probiotic, that's a fantastic one. It's Canadian. Um, so it, can, it has Canadian brand names and, um, uh, and uh, resources, and it's also got a great website. So if you're looking for more information, um, that's a really great resource. So if we think a little bit further, um, you know, other than diet and potentially pre and probiotics, what other levers can we pull? Um, through lifestyle to uh, try and promote gut health and the health of the gut microbiome. Um, stress, I, sleep, um, and physical you, activity. Can I interrupt yeah. you for one sec, just to go back uh, well, for one sec to probiotics? Because mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good question. Is it possible to get enough probiotics from food sources or are they recommended for, for <clears throat> the supplements recommended for everyone for optimal gut health? It's, it's a, a question, question I've also wondered. 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there is not a lot of data that that for those of us who are well and don't have a specific um, illness or or um, health concern um, that taking a probiotic is necessary. So if you generally have good gut health with no symptoms and you're generally quite well, um, there is not uh, data that that we need okay. to take a probiotic. Um, you know, maintaining your abundant and diverse microbiome through healthy nutrition is probably the most important thing that you can do. Okay. Um, and I think probiotics are, are kind of the, the bonus when when you're trying to to treat health, um, gut health or, or, or really replete um, your microbiome if you've had an illness or you've got specific symptoms. Um, right. But we don't need to treat them like an insurance policy. <laughs> you know, right. um, yeah. So lifestyle, um, I believe it or not, makes a difference on on the gut microbiome, and and uh, and so sleep matters. We know that when we have poor quality sleep, that that is uh, associated with uh, dysbiosis or an uh, a unhealthy balance of um, uh, bacteria inside the gut. When we are sleep deprived, there's less microbial diversity. This also alters the circadian rhythm of um, the, the microbes that are inside the gut. So the gut microbiome, there are a number of bacteria that actually have a circadian rhythm, um, uh, which I think is amazing. You know, it, wow. it, it, it means that, that the bacteria inside our gut and it's dark in there are being exposed to, um, light that we can sense. And, and, you know, all of those chemicals and neurotransmitters that go back and forth, um, that tell the microbiome whether or not it's day or night. So when we, um, when we have disruptions in our sleep and our circadian rhythm, it actually disrupts the circadian rhythm of the gut microbiome. And we also know that when we're sleep deprived or we don't have good quality sleep, we don't cope with stress or pain particularly well. And, and when that happens, um, you know, biochemically that affects uh, the gut and the microbiome through hormones, um, and inflammatory um, mediators, but it also changes our eating habits. So, you know, when we're sleep deprived, we tend to go for the stuff that's um, higher in sugar, higher in uh, fat, higher processed type of foods, all of which are uh, deleterious for the gut microbiome. So um, poor sleep has an impact not only on our own physiology and the physiology of the gut microbiome, it changes what we're eating and that further um, has a negative impact. So sleep actually uh, really matters. The same is also true for stress. We know that um, the more stress uh, that we have, um, there are changes in the composition, the diversity, and the function of the gut microbiome. Um, uh, and this has been associated with changes in intestinal barrier function. So really um, preventing that leaky gut concept uh, and it changes gut motility and, and immune function. So stress, um, you know, we know it impacts us, but it also impacts the health of our gut microbiome. And it's, it's really worth uh, considering how we manage our stress. And finally, exercise similarly um, has, has been linked to uh, a healthy gut microbiome. So in general, people who exercise more have more microbial diversity and uh, abundance, and they also tend to have more beneficial bacteria. They tend to have a more robust uh, intestinal barrier uh, and enhanced immune system. Um, so exercise and, and stress management really uh, are, are quite important for the health of the microbiome. So, and then finally, um, you know, the, the other things that are, are within our control that I think really are worth men mentioning is that smoking and alcohol have both been shown to, to be um, uh, hard on, on the lining of the gut um, directly, but also have negative impacts on the gut microbiome. So there are two, you know, lifestyle changes that we can make that are important considerations um, in this in entire chain. So um, I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions that it, any more questions that we have. Um, and then we have a little uh, newsletter and um, often I do other workshops that I'll post on the website. So 
if those are, are of interest to people, they're welcome to, uh, to scan there too. Oh, oh, Madeline, I think you're on, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm talking away to myself here. <laughs> uh, no, I just said I, I did the QR code for the last two. Uh, there is a wealth of information in there to, to sift through. So that's, that's so great. Thank you. Um, we, I think we just have two questions that have been yeah. uh, sitting mm -hmm. here patiently. Um, yeah, the one yeah, was well, on... Lots to consider and think about. Uh, uh, Melissa asks, curious thoughts on treating H. pylori um, with 714 day, 714 day, several times personally over a few years. Yeah. H. pylori is a loaded question. It, um, yeah, <laughs> that is like, there are, are textbooks written on H. pylori. So it's actually not a fast question. Um, but what I would say oh. is that, uh, you know, the regimens are really hard to take. They're usually triple or quadruple regimens. So two or three antibiotics plus an antacid, um, or Pepto-Bismol or some kind of combination. And it's, it's important actually to do a 14 day regimen in the vast majority of cases, um, because the rates of H. pylori antibiotic resistance are now extremely high. Um, and that can vary depending on what region of the country you're in, um, in, in terms of specific resistance patterns, but it's, uh, it's a really big emerging issue. So we want people to really do their best to get through the entire 14 days if they can. Um, and, you know, beyond that, there's actually like a lot of different <laughs> intricacies to H. pylori. Wow, thank you. Um, and uh, a question from Annie about peptides, like VPC-157. Um, yes, yes. I'm, I'm getting so many um, peptide questions lately and in like a number of different um, forums and um, they're really interesting. The bottom line is that, that there, there's still, you know, a lot of work to do in clinical trials and large population studies that, that just aren't out there yet. So um, I think that <clears throat> we'll see more and more of that, but but right now we we don't know exactly how to use them, for how long, for who, um, and for what indications. So I think there's a lot of excitement coming out around those. We also don't know how they interact with other types of medications, for example. Um, and, and there's just a, a lot that we don't know about them. So um, I think they have therapeutic potential. Uh, I know a lot of people are really excited, but but at the moment they're they're not available to us on a um, on a you know clinically relevant level. Um, although I know lots of people are trying to get their hands on them through through different means, they're not they're not currently licensed for us. So um, yeah, I think stay tuned because I think we'll start to see more of that. And I do I do okay. think they have potential. Yeah. So we probably have time for one one last question, and I think this is a question that um, kind of probably relates to everybody here uh, from Fraser. If someone has changed their diet or sleep or stress management in a significantly positive way, how long would you expect to take to see a physical change in their health? A month, three months, nine months? Like a reasonable expectation to yeah. see to see a shift. Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, when we start to change our diet, um, there are subtle changes in the gut microbiome, even within 24 to 48 hours. So, so um, things you wouldn't necessarily feel or notice, but those shifts actually have start to happen quite quickly. Um, it probably takes months to really start to notice all of those, those things start to accumulate. I think three to six months is a reasonable time frame to start to see um, positive changes ar around that. Um, of course, everyone's a little bit different. And it depends what else is, is happening in, in your health. Um, but I think three to six months is, is a reasonable um, strategy. Um, one of the things that's really interesting around prebiotics that I think people need to remember, you know, we talked last week about the microbiome being a little bit like a, um, a fingerprint. And, and it develops when we're, we're born. And it's really that fingerprint by the time we're about five years old is kind of ours. 
And when we shift our diet um, or we take um, probiotics, for example, those changes um, are, are that happen in the microbiome are not enduring unless we persist with it. So when you take a probiotic, if you really want to keep that, that bacteria in your gut and you're finding you're getting health benefits from it, you feel better, whatever the, the um, thing is that you're trying to treat, often you need to stay on that probiotic over the longer term. It's not usually just a short two week kind of try it and then come off it. So if you're noticing benefits in order to sustain them, um, we need to hang on to them because that gut microbiome that we have is like a fingerprint. And if we don't stay on a healthy diet, if we don't stay on our probiotic that's working for us, we will drift back to our old five-year-old finger. Yeah, that was a bit of information that I, I picked up that I, I, didn't, <coughs> I didn't realize that. Um, that's really helpful. So yeah, great. Well, I think it's been a, a, a another just um, a webinar full of great information. And if I think we pretty much got to most of the questions, they were might have been one or two outstanding. Um, please just you can email them to me and um, or again, they might uh, or or we'll try to our best if there's if they're still coming up, if they haven't been answered um, to answer them next week, there's so much that we want to know about this and so much that, that we, this, I think it's just so much information out there um, from so many different sources. So uh, I, I really appreciate this, this wise approach to, um, to gut health. It's hard to pack it all in an hour. I can mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to have to do some follow ups in uh, <laughs> as, mm -hmm. as the weeks go on. But um, I hope that everybody will come next week. We are talking about what's our topic for next week, Sarah? We're, we're going to talk about um, uh, chronic pain medications and how those affect the gut. So, you know, so I think yeah. so many people get constipation and various things relating to their medications. So we're going to try and dive into that. So we'll move away from the gut microbiome stuff and, and take a really practical approach to, um, to digestive health um, related to, to some of the interventions that we need. Right. Great. Thanks, and that actually, um, so there was a couple of questions, at least one that we didn't get to, uh, that was about side effects. So please bring that um, next week, because that's what we're going to dive into. So I yeah. uh, we'll look forward to that. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Mark to, to finish us up here. Yeah, no, that was that was very informative. Thank you. I'm looking forward to next week's as well from the, you know, the medication perspective, because that I think will be very applicable as well. Uh, it's been so useful and so much really valuable information. So thank you, Sarah. Okay. Lovely to great. see everyone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, cool. See you next week. Absolutely. See you next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for being here, everyone. And we will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.